Uh, as I look at what I'm going to share with the Word of God today, uh, I told Pastor Phil, it's not a topical message, but it's going to maybe feel like it because last Sunday I gave part A of what you might be looking at in verse 4 of 2 Corinthians 10. So I'm going to have you read out loud with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, and what we're going to be looking at are the weapons of our warfare, the weapons of our warfare. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 out loud, if you would, beginning with me now. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, the, this segment of scripture, this thought, actually goes two verses later. We're holding off on those. But I am going to go ahead and summarize uh, with these next two verses. Uh, the target that Paul has in mind is our obedience to Christ. And when it comes down to it, when we are followers of Christ, it comes down to that avenue of will we be obedient to Christ or not? The idea of being at war is not always uh, an easy concept. Sometimes it's easy when you need to go to war. Sometimes uh, it's not so easy to know. Should you engage? Should you not? Uh, this very morning, there's a pastor having to step into his pulpit. He's having to engage in spiritual warfare as he's confronting error in truth in his own church. Other churches are still trying to find their way through how to work through difficult problems. And, and can you sometimes see spiritual warfare happening right in, a, in an assembly, right in a church? Uh, reminded of, uh, of how this goes. Uh, you know, often we get our eyes off of Jesus, get our eyes on what our own issues are, and we make, we make battlegrounds <laughs> over, over the dumbest of things. Uh, and the truth is, it's going to come down for us as believers are we going to recognize that we're in a spiritual war, and are we going to engage in the way that God has designed? I gave a message last Sunday, particularly using um, the battle of Jericho and the idea that God is able to bring down fortresses and, and those strongholds that seem impossible to us. We really got there by looking at verses 3 and 4, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And yet I'm telling you that there are many believers who are being disobedient to verse 3 right now. I'm going to handle this my way. I'm going to settle it my way. There's something I like or don't like in the church or in my life or in my family. And I'm going to handle it. I'm just going to say that very often when we take it into our hands to handle it, it looks like we've handled it. I remember one guy who was described as a Christian leader, and they said, well, in describing his leadership, yeah, he was one of those pastors that got things done. And then it was followed by, you could tell what he got done by looking at the trail of dead bodies along the path, <laughs> right? So he was a get her done, but it was get out of my way so I can get her done, right? Well, I don't know if that's a fair description of that pastor. Maybe so, maybe not. Um, but we all have our carnality that we bring to the battle. And here's the point. We, we can make a choice on whether or not we're going to war in this spiritual warfare according to our flesh or not. But when we do so according to the flesh, we are being disobedient to God. And we are also being ineffective because that is not what God uses to bring down strongholds. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So I got a question for you though, but do we often fight spiritual battles carnally? I'm going to tell you that there are different kinds of strongholds that people have. Sometimes there's a battle in the church. Sometimes there's a battle of addictions. And we handle those things very often carnally, like I'm going to win this if I just try harder. And I'm going to tell you it's not trying harder, it's surrendering more. As we've said already, and you're going to come to the end of this passage, end of this verse anyway, it's not about your power, it's about God's. You need him, and I need him, and nobody in here is better than anybody else. Nobody in here, I don't think, is stronger than anybody else. We might have different 
uh, degrees of surrender. And I would argue that even when you could, uh, have that concept, think of that concept of surrender, there is even the stupidity of the carnal arrogance of pride to say, well, I'm surrendered more than you. You know, get over yourself. Love Jesus. Be obedient to him. Amen? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen, folks, there is no darkness in your life that God can't handle. He is the light of the world. There is no power in your life that is too great for God to deal with. There is no personality in your life that is too big for God to deal with. There is nothing on this planet that is more powerful than the king of kings. So stop acting like it is. And stop acting like we have to solve problems by doing it our way. You know that song, I did it my, you look like you did it your way. <laughs> Don't do it your way, do it God's way. Amen, that's good preaching. <laughs> Sometimes my southern roots come out, so... The weapons we have are mighty through God, not you. Strength does not come from you. Strength comes from God. They are mighty through God to what end, folks? So it's one thing to stand here this morning and say God is powerful and be right. It's one thing to say that God is almighty and be right. And to sing it and to glory in it, but I want to ask you to what end? Now, God can be mighty just because He is, but I want you to know that this passage is given an avenue to which God's mighty power is applied, and it is to the pulling down of strongholds. So I want to encourage you this morning that God is able, that God is able to help you where you are, but you're going to have to surrender to his power to see his power. You know, the uh, definition of insanity has often been this, doing the same thing and expecting different results. And some of you are lost and meandering in your life and you wonder what the answer is. The answer is the power of God. Some of you are dealing with some kind of addiction in your life and some kind of struggle in your life. And by the way, I'm, I'm all for support groups as long as those support groups are edifying you in Jesus. But I'm going to tell you something. And you're, I'm, you know, sometimes I, I know our church family already knows this, but you know, if this visitor, you're about to get an opinion. Um, but sometimes people want to know about, you know, pastor, will you counsel? And yes, I love people. I want to counsel them. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do every time within my ability. You're going to tell me what your problem is. I'm going to listen. I'm going to be compassionate. But I'm going to tell you the truth. But I can't do the truth for you. And you cannot do the truth for me. You're going to have to make a decision. Will you do the truth and live under the truth of God's word or not? But the answers to your life are not going to be found in your carnal power or even in your carnal methodologies. We have to adopt and adapt to the truth of God's word and surrender to his methodologies, to his weapons of warfare. And I'm going to tell you, it's a lot like what you hear in politics. If you want to know the truth, it's almost always the opposite of whatever someone is saying. It's almost always the And your carnal reaction is almost always not the right reaction. If you want to do it God's way, you need to know what God's way is. 
So a little bit of a platform, and this is going to sound topical because I am going to springboard off of this for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling it down of strongholds. I want to look through scripture and this will not be comprehensive because each one of these is worthy of its own study. But one of the weapons that God uses is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you will take your Bibles there. So here's what I want to tell you. You with me? All right. Do you, do you want God to help you? This, this is not counseling 101. This is the word of God today. Amen. All right. So I'm not going to smile you to obedience. I'm not going to warm you to obedience. I'm not going to warm you to embracing. I'm going to give you the truth and you're going to make a decision. But I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to tell you about God's way this morning. This world needs the preaching of the word of God to know God's way as opposed to the world's way. One of the weapons that is not often considered a weapon that God uses is preaching. So if you want help, come hear the word of God. If you want help, Inundate, saturate yourself with the word of God. God uses, as we're going to see in this passage, the foolishness of preaching to break through the hearts of men. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 24. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, the preaching of the cross is what? It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? <coughs> Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now here I'm coming back from Oregon. It's good to be home. <laughs> but I'm seeing in signs, in yards, and, and I didn't get to see this one, but on Oregon, Oregon, it, it, I, in my little time there, it's, it's a battle of ideology. It's a battle of man's uh, belief that I can fix this without truth. And I, I'm frankly, that's everywhere. But, but I look in yards and some of the signs that I see are, uh, I believe in science. And I, those are on the team. You know, you know the signs, right? One said, uh, no, don't, don't get offended. I'm just going to tell you what the sign said. I believe in women's rights. I believe in science. I believe it, uh, that, that no person is illegal. I believe in, there was more. There's like five or six. And, and I want to say, you know, I believe in the word of God that corrects every false ideology. And I, I don't like being painted in a corner when you talk about, when you say, I believe in women's rights as if other people don't if they don't say it the same way you do. But I believe in the truth of the word of God. I believe that God is able to reach the hearts of people. And God says that he does it with the foolishness of preaching. And to the world, he's not looking at the wise of the world and calling them wise. He's calling them the foolish of the world. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Does this world look foolish? It does to the believer. And by the way, if you're not a believer this morning and you think this world makes sense... I think you would be deceiving yourself. For you can see the battle in society as it stands right now. The confusion of the world. And by the way, the world is just living out biblical truth. Right now, when you have a, an increasing magnification of a society that is devoid of the knowledge of God or the will to obey him, you have men doing what seems right to them. And it's a mess. Unless you think it's true, how do you know then what the will of the people is? And frankly, it comes back down to this ultimately. Might makes right. 
And I'm thankful instead of might making right that we have the word of God given by the mightiest of all the great king of kings. But he gives you the choice to decide, will you surrender to his truth? Now be careful, believer. This isn't just for the lost. This isn't for the lost to say, hey, you know, you're not believing God's word. Every believer in this room needs to believe God's word. Matter of fact, this is what's happening right now while I'm preaching. There's a pastor confronting his people with truth. And in that truth, those people are going to have a decision. Will they come to obedience to God or not? And the pastor's responsibility is just to point to the truth of what God says. Verse 21 in 1 Corinthians 1. This is not going to get done on one Sunday, I'm just telling you. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 verse 21 for after the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe you want to be saved you hear the word of God you hear that Jesus is the only way and the way to be saved is to surrender to that truth and come to Jesus verse 22 for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks Seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, and the gospel is able to bring down any stronghold of unbelief and of resistance if you will surrender to his truth. Pastor Jace is passing out Gospels of John. Who was with him when he was doing this? Raise your hand, team. So Anna, anybody else with him when he was at the downtown passing out tracks? Anna, Thomas. So as he's passing out the Gospel of John, it's a prayer booth. They're offering to pray for people. That's all they're offering is to pray for people, passing out Gospels of John and some tracts. And as he's passing those out, one lady passes by and she sees what they're talking about and uh, hears about Jesus. And she says, we already killed Jesus. I'm Jewish. Have a good day. Uh, And off she went. To the, so Pastor Titus' answer to that was, Well, it didn't work, (laughs) you know. uh, 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 (laughs) Christ is alive and the Savior of the world to all who will believe. So right now you have the world kind of holding their fists at their side like a three-year-old throwing a fit in Walmart, saying no. And I don't want to believe. And you know what? A gracious God gave you a choice. Nobody is going to be standing before God and saying, you are not righteous because you didn't give me the opportunity. God has put it on everyone's heart that lives on this planet that there is a God. He gave his Holy Spirit to this world so that the world would be drawn to Christ. But it comes down to, will we believe? Well, the, the Lord's weapon that he uses is preaching. Now, preaching happens right here, happens from this pulpit, but it happens in your life as you go and you speak Jesus. So you're a preacher as well. You're, you're a disciple of Christ, an ambassador of Jesus, according to 2 Corinthians 5, and we carry the message of the gospel wherever we go. And that message, that preaching of that word is a weapon that God uses. Now, we're going to dive in to some other passages here, but I'd like you to take your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We're largely going to be in Ephesians 6, which is not a surprise for many of you who know the weapons of our warfare. I think for sake of time, I'm going to read it because it'll slow us down to read it together. I like reading together, but I'm going to read it for us. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, 
Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, Ephesians 6. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to what? Stand. The idea of count me as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery, fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereto with all perseverance, the endurance and supplication for all saints. What are the weapons of our warfare? God uses preaching, but preaching is a reflection of what you find and what our second one is here, having your loins gird about with truth. So if you want to know what the weapon of your warfare is, it is truth. Truth has a way of piercing through the night. So we were in a cave. First time I've been in a cave. <clears throat> and was, uh, as Pastor Titus said, you could fit two semi-trucks stacked on top of each other as you walk through the cave. And then there were times where Naomi was ducking to walk through. And what we did is we had turned off all of our headlamps at certain places, and what do you think that felt like in a cave? First of all, getting a bunch of teenagers quiet in a cave is quite a feat. <laughs> I think their nervous energy would not stop. Um, but in that silence, you know the kind of darkness where you can't see your hand in front of your face? So Pastor Laramie just took the moment to say, this is what the light of Jesus is like. The smallest light in that darkness is able to be seen. And what does that mean when Jesus says he is the light of the world? The light is an invitation to come. But it's to come to the truth out of the darkness. And really, folks, what you see around you, all around you in this world, is a, a world that is influenced by Satan as a liar and the father of lies. The world is inundated with the lies of the devil. Everyone's chasing those lies with the idea that if I follow this and if I finally got what I wanted, then I would be happy. And what you would find is outside of Jesus, you may get what you want and yet still, still have that deep, dark void and emptiness of simply being lost. But Satan is a great deceiver. He's going to lie to you. Matter of fact, uh, what is Oregon known for? I don't know. What's Oregon known for to you? It's a pretty place. Do you have anything that stands out in your mind of what Oregon's known for? I don't know what you think it's known for, but it, now that I've come back, I think it's known for marijuana. That's what I think it's known for. I, never, I still don't know for sure if I know fully the sm sm smell of marijuana, but people that say that they've smelt that before, they know it. And Well, let me give you an illustration. We're, we're driving somewhere, and I see, you, you know the symbols of health? What are they? What are the symbols of medicinal health? What are they? They are usually a red cross. Now, what else is a symbol of health? It's found on ambulances, and it comes from Numbers chapter 21. And it is the serpent on the staff. And everybody here should know that that's a picture of Jesus. So the world knows that symbol, and, and in marijuana stores, the medicinal marijuana, they have, as it's called, uh, they have a green cross with a green uh, stick and a snake on the stick. And, and what's the idea? If you only had marijuana, your life would be happy. Now, by the way, this isn't a discussion for, you know, is there any medicinal use? 
But I am telling you, that is not what you're seeing in Oregon. <laughs> and what you're seeing is a lot of people saying, hey, you know, someone said, you know, uh, I, was, I was saying the weather there is about 10 degrees cooler than here. And they said, yeah, they're, well, they're higher than us. And I said, yeah, they are. <laughs> You had better decide to base your life on truth. It's your only hope. It's your only hope. So can other people deceive you? You'll find out sometime. But part of the greater danger is that you can deceive yourself. That you can start swallowing the lies of the devil. That's, you know, if you just had this, you'd be happy. You know, I, I know that God wants you to love him most, but if you just had this, then your life would be content. I'm telling you, folks, that's the lie of the devil. You have to make decisions to base your life on truth. We'll come back to that more. The next thing he gives in the arsenal, there's preaching, your loins girt about with truth, and then having on the breastplate of righteousness. Take your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. There's a lot of doctrinal discussion. I think it's unnecessary. I appreciate it, but people ask, what is the breastplate of righteousness? <clears throat> I, try, I think they often try to make it too singular. And they separate out two concepts of what is the breastplate of righteousness. Well, first of all, let me ask you something. How much righteousness do you have? Outside of Jesus, what you got? Well, there's a lot of people who believe they got some good things to bring to the table. But according to God, you know Romans 3.10, as it is written, you know what? There is none righteous but me. As it is written, there is none righteous, well, you. But I'm okay. So the, the statement stands, nobody's righteous. Nobody, is, nobody has their righteousness that they can tout to say, look, I'd get it right. I do it right. I get it right. I, I'm the one that's got the answers to all of mankind's problems. And I've got the, I, if you just followed me, the only one that can say that is Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, this is that passage that tells us about being ambassadors for Christ. Verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This is the gospel. You want to be saved? You want to be right with God? You have got to come to Jesus where he has offered to reconcile your life. And reconciling your life means that he has paid for every last sin. The word reconciled has the idea behind it, a zero balance. None of your sin is left unaccounted for. You come to Christ and he will save you, as the Bible says, to the uttermost. But verse 21, for he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who what? Knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen? So why, how can we have righteousness? We don't have righteousness because we have it. We have righteousness because we are covered by the blood of Christ. He has reconciled the account of my sin. There is no sin unpaid for when you come to Christ in faith. His blood covers it all. So the breastplate of righteousness <coughs> is the idea that we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And we stand in his righteousness. Is the world going to accuse you? Are believers going to be nice to you? <coughs> you hope. <laughs> but not always. What are you going to do? Listen, folks, sometimes all we can do is put our heads on our pillow at night and stand in the, and, and, and go to sleep in the embrace of Jesus. <coughs> know that he is our rock. He is the one that has declared us to be right with him not based on anything that we've done. <coughs> but there's a second component to this. The armor of righteousness is also found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Pastor Phil, 
I need a water. <coughs> Sorry. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse four through seven. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So what is the breastplate of righteousness? If you're going to face or fight this spiritual warfare, you not only can't stand in your own righteousness, you have to stand in the righteousness of Christ But it's that relationship with Jesus Christ that works out in you a righteousness that reflects the relationship with Jesus Christ. So, in other words, commentaries will argue over, is this our positional righteousness in Christ? Or is this our sanctified righteousness as we live the Christian life in the world? And they argue over which one it is. And I'm saying it's not either or, it's both and. So let me say it to you this way. How do you wage spiritual warfare? Well, there's preaching. There's a decision to stand on the truth. And there is a decision to stand in the manifestation of righteousness as it relates to Jesus Christ. So let me say it this way. Doing what's right in God's sight because you love him is a protection for every believer. It will keep you from error. It will keep you from doing the wrong thing. It will keep you from going astray if you come back to him which is right and live your life in obedience to that righteousness. We know the verse we've said, I think, almost every Sunday uh, recently, Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So righteousness is a protector, but not your own righteousness. Righteousness that flows out of relationship with Jesus Christ. So here's the point. If you decide not to live according to the righteousness of God, is that going to go well? All right, folks. So here, here's the thing. I'm sitting across from I'm sitting across from four ladies in this family fun day at the park. I start by talking to two, and as I'm talking to the two, um, I just start to hear a little bit of their testimony. I, I ask them about their lives and what brought them here and what they do. And one of them is, my paraphrase, is a coach for those that are addicted or coming out of addiction. And then uh, two other ladies are listening to the conversation and they come over and now they're talking and I'm sitting on the grass talking to these four ladies and every one of them is either coming out of addiction or has a testimony of being like a year or two. I think one of them was six years clean. And in tears, you know, one of them's asking the other one, hey, I'm looking for help. Do you know any safe houses and, and, and things like this? And and I immediately turn to Pastor Laramie and I introduce these ladies to Pastor Laramie and I say, hey, this is why this church is here, to help people just like you where you are. A church can't do it all, but a church can help. Let these folks minister to you. Let these folks help you. But every one of them would tell you that Satan, and this is my phrase every time, and it does it to, the, it does it to, the, to lost who don't obey Jesus, and it does to save people who are disobedient to Jesus. Satan will chew you up and spit you out. And this might, when I walk away from the, these ladies, I'm saying Satan has chewed on them. And let me just give you the summary. It ain't fun. By the way, this will come up again, okay? If you listen to those those ladies, and I asked them, if you could talk to somebody else about how not to get where you were, what would you tell them? 
They didn't know where to begin, but I asked them, and I just listened to their common thread. You know what their common thread for how they got where they were was? What was their common thread? You think about it. What would their common thread be? What was their common thread? Well, here's what they said. Here's what, are you ready? Here's what they said. Rebellion. At the time, friends made it seem cool. At the time, it seemed fun. But that's exactly what Satan will do. And if he can, he'll take you to the grave with it. The armor of righteousness is standing in the righteousness of Jesus. And as a believer, manifesting that righteousness to the world. It's looking like Jesus to the world. Pastor Jason's response to that lady, my paraphrase, but I think I got it right. The lady that walked by and says, well, we killed Jesus already. I'm a Jew. Are you ready for that response? Pastor Jason's reply to that was, well, Jesus loves you anyway. If you're going to listen to your flesh, your flesh might, might want to go, well, you know, you might want to be angry or, or ugly. But what Pastor Jay said is right. We don't war after the world's warfare. We don't outshout them. We don't out-argue them. It's the grace of God that reaches any one of us. And the world needs that, and it needs to look like Jesus. These are the weapons of our warfare. We've got to be done. Verses 15 through 17 are more paths of God's righteous weapons. We're going to look at them. Next week, if I'm still here, and if God lets me, we're going to go into part three of this. But here's where it's going to come down to. Remember, we've got to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 before we're done. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And here's what it's going to come down to, folks. We didn't read all the verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 has some beautiful doctrine for us to know. But how par- powerful is the word of God to bring down strongholds? Well, there is a decision then that we as believers make on really everything that we encompass or deal with in the world. In verse 5, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to what? Here it is, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now it goes on in verse 6 and gives you more of that language. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So really, we're talking about spiritual warfare. We're talking about the weapons of that warfare. But really what is undergirding all of this is simply this word, obedience. So believer, does your obedience to Christ matter? Does warring the way God says matter? I'm going to tell you, this Pastor Phil and I just had a snippet of a moment. And, and in our conversation, we're talking about some churches that are struggling. And this is how they're struggling. Churches that don't want to obey God. And this is what it looks like. Snuff, snuff, snuff them out. Why? Because they don't look like Jesus. And are we followers of Christ or not? Are we going to surrender to him or not? And here's the point. This world needs to see Jesus. And I believe that this place, Fellowship Baptist Church, can be blessed of God if we will hold tenaciously to the truth of God's word and our Savior. If we will not only believe these things, but hold them to be true and obey them, I believe there will be blessing. It doesn't mean that I don't think there will be challenges, that there won't be battles, but in those battles, we need to commit to looking like our Savior. So for those who are lost this morning or maybe confused about the gospel, let me just say this as we're done. The hope of the world is Jesus Christ. 
And he wants to meet you where you are. He wants to bring you into his family. And he is the, really the answer to whatever turmoil you're going through. He is the one. We didn't even get here. We stopped shy in the spiritual warfare on the gospel. But what the gospel does is the gospel brings peace. And if you want it, you have got to come to Christ and he will give it. But believer, you may have been obedient to the gospel, but I just want to challenge you. Be obedient in the sanctification process as well. Let God have his way with you. Can we agree to do that this morning? Now, really, what that, what that last question was, are you ready? That last question was a call to worship. For that's what worship looks like. Worship is falling in obedience to the King of Kings.